Good evening, everybody. Since we're uh, being very uh, casual tonight, I get to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ron Long. I was a photographer at Simon Fraser University for 36 years. And for 15 of those years, uh, I worked exclusively for the biology department. So I picked up quite a bit of biology uh, during that time. And it was back in the early 70s that I became interested in native plants. First of all, just photographing them because they made pretty pictures. And then I wanted to know the names, so I bought some books. And then I wanted to know a little bit more about them, so I bought more books. And after that, it became kind of uh, my life's work. <laughs> so for the last 40 years, I've been plant hunting pretty extensively in BC. And uh, I have not come across anywhere else in the province a place that has the biodiversity of Pink Mountain. Uh, I have, I'm calling this revisited because I've made a total of three trips. Uh, the first one is um, in 1983, the second one was in 2003, and the third was this past summer when I spent a month up there. And um, it turns out that the, the story from 2003 to 2010 has changed drastically. It's just a totally different story. And so uh, this is a, a completely new look at, at Pink Mountain. And the fact that it is so far north, uh, no one in the south has any idea of what's going on up there. Uh, and, and Pink Mountain is just a, just a small part of the, the uh, resource development that is really doing um, uh, extensive damage out of sight and out of mind. Um, while I was there this year, I also made um, a plant collection Plants are my primary interest, and that's uh, the group that I know best, um, because no one had ever made uh, an extensive collection at Pink Mountain before. But uh, well, first of all, where is Pink Mountain? Down near the bottom, we have Prince George, and up to Fort St. John. And there's a, a, a small community about 180 um, miles north of Fort St. John, uh, I'm sorry, 180 kilometers. Uh, the community of Pink Mountain consists of a motel on one side of the road and a small store and a gas pump on the other side, and that's it. And just to the west of the community of Pink Mountain is the mountain itself. And you can see that it's quite isolated here. Pink Mountain is the first bump of the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains are all to the west, and Alberta is to the, to the east. The top of Pink Mountain is relatively flat. The west side here is very steep. Those, uh, those dark lines are, are deep uh, ravines along the, side of, uh, along the west side. The east side is much gentler, and on the south end, you see, you probably won't be able to see it back there, but the road zigzags up to the, the summit. Looking at Pink Mountain from below, it's a pretty unassuming mountain. Uh, it's only 1,700 meters or 5,800 feet at its highest point, but it's so far north that the summit is uniformly alpine tundra, which is a fairly um, limited habitat in British Columbia. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The summit is accessible by a, a narrow, very rough, and zigzag road. It's only about 23 kilometers from the Alaska Highway to the highest point on Pink Mountain, but typically it would take me uh, a minimum of two hours to 
get to the top and some days I didn't and never did get to the top because there was so much to see along that road. I would typically head up early in the morning because that's when most of the wildlife was um, around, out and about, so to speak. I saw moose every other day. I saw bears almost every day. Uh, these, these things are, um, are, are so plentiful. I even saw pine martens on two different occasions. And this is really um, something that doesn't happen very often. In all my, my years, I had never seen a pine martin before. They're, they're pretty secretive animals. But it's an indication of just how uh, diverse and um, the wildlife is on Pink Mountain. There are also white-tailed white deer and elk. I know that the white-tails are there because there's the tail. That's as close as I got. Uh, the, the elk and the, and the deer are apparently pretty heavily hunted, so they don't give you any opportunity to, uh, to even get a look at them. But up on the summit, the situation seems to be a little different. This is a stone sheep. And um, I came around a curve on, uh, on the, the summit and spotted him. He was about half a kilometer from me. And he looked up and, and saw me at about the same moment. And um, as soon as he saw me, he immediately started moving directly towards the vehicle. Um, I just sat and waited. And he came right up to about five meters of the, of the vehicle, crossed the road, uh, right in front of me, and then posed. <laughs> All I had to do was lower the passenger side window and from the driver's seat, point my camera at him and uh, make that, that wonderful photograph. But you're completely unafraid. And in fact, absolutely curious. There are also woodland caribou that make continuous use of the summit and they similarly are just curious and will approach very closely without any uh, hesitation at all. Now, the, the hoary marmots, uh, there's a bit of a story to them. In 1983, on my first visit, there were hoary marmots everywhere um, to the point where they were a nuisance. They would, uh, if you put a backpack on the ground, there would be two or three of them chewing on it. They were continually underneath my vehicle, and I could hear them chewing under there, wondering what they were chewing on. Uh, but, so they were, they were, uh, they didn't know what people were. They were completely naive, and um, in fact, I had one even licking the, the fly dope off my hand at one point. Um, now, in those days, there was um, a Forest Service fire lookout on Pink Mountain. And so during the summer, there was a, sort of a semi-official presence on the top of Pink Mountain. And all of these marmots were thriving um, under that regime. In 2003, that, that uh, lookout tower had been abandoned, so there was no um, official presence. And there was almost no marmots. The few that were left were so um, totally un unapproachable that I was not able to get a photograph at all. So I'm assuming that some local sportsman went up there and shot, shot all these tame marmots. This is a large part of the culture of the North. If it moves, you shoot it. Well. This year, I was uh, happy to see that the numbers seem to be increasing again. And uh, even some of the old naivety seemed to be coming back. When I stopped uh, to try and photograph this guy, he was, uh, he was along the, the side of the road. Uh, he, as soon as my vehicle stopped, he immediately just made a beeline. He came 
uh, leaping down over the rocks, just scrambling. He was just so curious that he couldn't wait to get to the vehicle. And even though I was standing out there, he was totally ignoring me and just exploring underneath the vehicle. On another occasion, I had one get under there and I actually had to, I wanted to leave, but I was afraid to drive away for fear of running over him. I had to get down and throw rocks under the vehicle until I, I drove him off. And then something I had never seen before, a pair of this year's young put on a little play fighting exhibition for me. Now, I'm not a birder, but uh, there are a few uh, interesting birds on Pink Mountain. Again, no one has done a survey, so we don't really know what, um, what birds are there. But uh, as I say, there's a few that, that I've uh, recognized. This is a snipe. Um, back in the days when they used to shoot just about anything that flew for food, snipe were known to be difficult to hit because of their erratic flight. So any hunter that was uh, good enough to be able to bring down a snipe became known as a sniper. <laughs> um, the white-tailed ptarmigan, this is the only bird that overwinters um, in, the, in the alpine tundra. And it's got some interesting adaptations, aside from the fact that it changes color throughout the year. In the winter, it's pure white and uh, in the summer it's dark brown. So at every stage of the season, it's, it's almost perfectly camouflaged. But they have um, a special arrangement of feathers around their nostrils, which actually warm the air before they inhale it. And they also develop in the winter uh, a set of feathers on their toes that increase their foot area and um, acts like snowshoes. There's the uh, getting towards the summer coloration. We have horned larks. This is the, um, the only true lark that's native to North America. And um, as most of you will know, the birds typically will pick a, a high perch and sit up there and make their call. And that's sort of declaring that this is my territory. On a mountaintop, there are no high perches. And so the horned larks have developed this, this flight that substitutes where they will fly in a spiral straight up, calling the whole time. And they have big voices. You can easily hear them for a long distance. And they'll fly straight up until they disappear. And you can still hear them calling up there. And then they'll turn and they'll spiral back down, calling, calling, calling all the way until the instant their feet touch the ground, the call stops. So it's just a, an interesting adaptation. Um, I first heard about Pink Mountain from a butterfly collector. And it turns out that Pink Mountain is known worldwide as a place to collect rare Arctic butterflies. And when this collector first told me about it, and this is back in, in 83, it immediately occurred to me to, that if there were rare butterflies there, there must be rare plants. And so I went up there uh, within weeks of learning about this, and, um, and sure enough, the, uh, it was a very special place for plants. Um, now I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to learn more about the the butterflies there because they, although it has this reputation, nobody seems to put together a thorough collection of the butterflies. So that's another thing that needs to be done. Uh, now before I go on, I should mention that uh, for the first week of my month there this year, I had uh, Daniel Mosquin with me, who you may know from the botanical garden here on campus. And um, Daniel turns out turned out to be a really uh, important part of, uh, of this story. Now, when I first reached the summit on my first trip, I immediately knew it was a special place because of this plant. This beautiful miniature rhododendron is, um, 
never more than about four centimeters tall. It only grows in the far north, and, um, uh, and it's, it's just very rarely seen. I've never seen it any place else, and, um, and it's, it, it turns out that it's typical of most of the plants that occur on Pink Mountain. They're not endangered, but they're rarely seen because they um, occur in such remote um, habitat. But on Pink Mountain, this little rhododendron is abundant, uh, but the flowers only last for a few days, so you have to be there at just the right time in order to see it. And it turns out that um, that the Pink Mountain, the, the Pink Mountain record was a new record for British Columbia. Previously, it wasn't known to occur that far south. Now, these range maps I'm taking from the illustrated flora of BC, uh, it's the, the most up-to-date published information that, that we have. And um, as we'll see, there, there are quite a number of, um, of range extensions compared to what was previously known. I have always been uh, very intrigued and fascinated by uh, alpine tundra plants because they're growing in such a harsh environment that they've had to make just a wonderful array of adaptations to allow them to survive there. In this case, it's the, the, the thick wool that protects the bulbs, the uh, buds as they develop uh, from wind desiccation and from the um, ultraviolet light, which is very intense at high elevation. And then when fully developed, it, uh, it turns into this, this beautiful alpine plant. Another of the louse warts, um, again, it's not uncommon, but it's rarely seen. Same with this, uh, this one as well, rarely seen. Most of these, um, Louse warts only occur in the far north, and that's uh, that's why we're we're just not very familiar with them. Um, in all of BC, there are 13 species of Particularis, and Pink Mountain has five of them, and and and, and the five that are hardest to find and and most rarely seen. And then, in addition, there's this one, which I have not been able to identify. Uh, which, being as how this is Pink Mountain, would not supply. Surprised me a bit if uh, it turned out to be a new species. The alpine forget-me-not, tiny, tiny flowers, six, seven millimeters across, but they are so bright that you can see them from um, from walking height. It's one one of the one of the ones that uh, that you can see without stooping down. And the three, three two saxifrage. Um, one of the easier saxifrages to uh, recognize because of the three sharp teeth on the leaf. Uh, very small flowers, but very beautiful flowers. Uh, those sharp teeth on the leaves make you very cautious about where you put your hand down because uh, they are stiff and sharp. Now, the highlight of my entire summer was coffee break on top of Pink Mountain. Most of the time I, I had the mountain top to myself and uh, it was so quiet that there was no sound other than the buzzing of the insects. And you could hear a, um, a, a bumblebee approaching long before you could see it. And besides that, you could sit there all day just looking at the views in every direction. Uh, if you're looking to the west, you're looking into the snow-capped Rockies, higher Rockies. Looking to the east, the view starts at your toes and extends halfway across Alberta. And the sky is so close and so ever-changing that in it, it uh, alone could keep you occupied for, for hours. I mean, every few minutes, there the view wherever you're looking is different. So it's just a marvelous place to be. 
There's nothing uh, particularly special about white spruce except I had never seen it at this particular stage and I just couldn't resist photographing those beautiful cones. The Arctic poppy is another plant adapted to the Arctic uh, or the, the uh, alpine uh, environment. Uh, it's seemingly uh, f strange because it has a, a, an unusually tall stem. The wind is so constant uh, on, in the alpine that anything that grows tall, uh, tall is battered to bits. But um, this species has evolved to tolerate the wind. The stem is very um, uh, wiry, very tough, so it's not broken by the wind. You look at the buds, uh, they're covered with dark hairs, uh, which absorb heat from the sun, giving the developing bud a little bit more heat to work with. And the flowers are parabola shaped which means they also collect heat from the sun and concentrate it on the, uh, on the center part of the flower. One of the problems that plants have in this environment is, uh, is that pollination is very iffy. There are, are no honey, um, um, honeybees at this elevation. It's too cold for them. There are a few bumblebees, but most of the pollination is done by flies and flies are notoriously unreliable as pollinators because they, they go from one species to another to another and so there's no, or there's little chance of pollen being transferred from one flower to another of the same. But if you can keep that fly in your particular flower a little bit longer because it's a little warmer there, you have a better chance of it picking up more pollen and, uh, and transferring it successfully. Now, as the flower ages, you can see how the, uh, the wind battering has affected the, the, the petals, but that's okay because the petals of, by now have uh, done their job and the seed capsule is uh, developing. And as the capsule ripens and dries out, around the upper edge here, a series of openings develop just around the, the, the cap. And as that tall stem continues to be flailed around by the wind, those openings act just like a pepper shaker and spread the seed um, in a considerable uh, circumference around the parent plant. So the, 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 the plant has, has developed this tall stem at the risk of, of uh, battering in order to distribute its, its seed. Now, alpine fireweed is not by any means uh, a rare plant. It's, uh, it's fairly common in the north, but it grows in the mountains, not on the mountains. You find it growing in river valleys, but it is extremely unusual to the point where I had never ever seen it growing actually on the alpine tundra before. So, Pink Mountain is providing conditions that allow plants that shouldn't be growing that high to actually survive up there. And the, uh, the death camas is another. This is typically a subalpine plant growing in the more uh, benign environment down below the tree line. But once again, completely unexpectedly, I found it growing on the summit of Pink Mountain up in the exposed tundra. The lingonberry is one of the few evergreen plants. It grows very flat on the ground and it spends the winter hunkered down uh, under the snow and um, the leaves become um, a primary food of the, uh, the ptarmigan uh, during the winter. There's a number of sangfoils that occur up there, including this species, which is well known in, in um, the gardening community. It's widely used as a, as a uh, garden plant and typically grows 
a meter tall, but here it is um, in, in full flower, fully mature, and it's only about 10 centimeters high. Labrador tea, uh, uh, it's a plant that, that typically will grow um, five, six uh, meters tall or, or even taller. But on Pink Mountain, there is a, a subspecies that grows flat on the ground and uh, it, it's um, only about five centimeters tall. And that's, uh, that's, as, high as, uh, that's as tall as it gets. And once again, this was not known to occur uh, this far south before I collected it. The moss campion is a, a classic tundra plant. Uh, again, it's not rare, but Pink Mountain has an unusual amount of this species there. It's classic because it's low to the ground and it has a rounded shape that allows the wind to flow over it. The, the tightly bunched stems also reduce desiccation and, um, and trap wind, wind blown bits of, of soil and, and vegetative material until the plant actually creates a mound. And the temperature within those uh, densely packed stems is, is actually higher, measurably higher, than the air temperature around. It's always a treat to find that one. I have not been able to figure out why this is called purple arnica because there's nothing purple about it. But um, it is described in the literature as infrequent in BC, but um, and always in the far north, but on Pink Mountain, we have pretty substantial uh, populations of it. A major surprise this year was to find an orchid growing on the tundra. This does not happen. Uh, orchids just are, are not known to, um, to grow in that habitat. This particular one is described as infrequent in the province. And um, uh, so grow, finding it growing anywhere is pretty special, but finding it growing on the tundra was just amazing. But this is, this is Pink Mountain. We don't have just one orchid. I found two of them this year. Now this species in itself is nothing particularly um, uh, uh, unique. It, it grows widely all over the all over the province. It's never never common, never numerous. But again, it should not be growing in the tundra habitat. Um, in the, the the illustrated flora of BC does not describe this as a potential habitat for this species at all, which means that. It's never been collected in that habitat before. And even the floor of Alaska describes it as growing up to 900 meters, which is only half of the elevation of Pink Mountain. So this is a, another indication that Pink Mountain is just a very unique and special place. And here we have the orchids growing uh, right alongside the road, which unfortunately means that they're badly uh, exposed to anybody who happens to pull off the road at that point. Western paintbrush, uh, very plentiful on Pink Mountain, and, but it had, was not known to grow that far north. So the, the, the significance of these range extensions is that it's illustrating how little study has been done in the north. We don't know what's there. And, um, well, we'll see where that's going. In BC, we have two miniature bluebells. Both of them grow in the alpine tundra. They only grow at high elevation. You never see this one more than as, as individual or, or very few scattered plants when you do come across it. And um, they're not considered rare, uh, um, endangered, but they're rare enough that whenever I find them, I, I, I just uh, think of it as a very special treat. 
Now, this particular one I had seen on Pink Mountain before, but as I say, only one or two scattered plants here and there. The other miniature bluebell is similar in that you never see very many of them. You're lucky if you see three in a, in a location. And um, I hadn't seen it on Pink Mountain before this year, and, but because I was there for an extended time, I was there right through the entire flowering period, and uh, it turned out that there were just hundreds of these on Pink Mountain. Now, I, I'm familiar with this plant from other mountains, but I've never seen them in anywhere near the kind of numbers that, uh, uh, that, uh, that occur on Pink Mountain. Now, the, the silence and the isolation uh, of a place like this, they, they do kind of strange things to you. Uh, when I'm photographing these small plants, uh, these flowers are about a centimeter um, long. So they're pretty small, and I'm down on, on the ground, and I'm concentrating pretty, pretty hard. And while I was photographing this, I, I heard this strange sound. It was, it was close, and it was loud. It startled me. I jumped up, and I looked around, and there was nothing. And the sound came again. It was my stomach growling. <laughs> I'd forgotten to have lunch. <laughs> Um, another uh, plant that has adapted to this uh, very difficult environment, because pollination is so chancy, some of the plants have developed backups. So uh, while these have, uh, have fully developed flowers and they're capable of setting seed if they happen to get pollinated, but they also have these, these red bulbs along the stem. Uh, they're they're uh, in the leaf axles. And they can drop to the ground and allow the plant to, to reproduce vegetatively in case the, the, the seeds are not produced. But that's not, it doesn't stop there. Among the roots, it has another set of bulbs that also will allow the plant to reproduce vegetatively. So this is why these plants are so fascinating to me. It's the way that they have, have adapted. Um, Another saxifrage, uh, the, um, the flowers are, are small, about a centimeter across. And um, the, these plants are described as having typically one flower, but this is Pink Mountain. The plants up there typically has, have three flowers. I've never seen this plant any place but on Pink Mountain, and it's really interesting, again, because of its adaptation. Um, and the adaptation is these, these long runners that come out from the base of the plant. Uh, those runners will continue growing out along the ground until the end finds a little niche or, or a, a, a little hole in the ground where it, it pushes itself in. And on the end of each one of those runners is a tiny offset plant that will be rooted there, away from the parent plant, the runner dries up, and um, again, just in case the seeds aren't set, the plant's got a backup plant. Northern Monk's Hood, you can see where the name comes from, the, the, uh, the hood-shaped flower. Uh, it's another plant that only occurs in the far north, one that you don't see unless you um, unless you go right into the northern third of the province. It occurs all over Pink Mountain from top to bottom. But strangely enough, it is more plentiful on the top of the mountain where growing conditions you would think are more difficult. But um, for some reason, the, the plant prefers those rough conditions. This was a first for me. I've never seen this plant before. Tiny, it's only about uh, uh, two centimeters tall, maybe, maybe three. Uh, it occurs, it's known to occur all over the province, but you never ever see it in, in large numbers. I found only this single plant on Pink Mountain. Unfortunately, was able to identify it from the, from the photograph. Another little sandwort, another 
tiny, tiny plant. See, the growing season on the tundra is so short that most of the plants just don't have time to grow very big. So they are small. This one is another two centimeter tall um, um, plant, but still exquisite if you look at them closely enough. When you're walking across the tundra, you miss a great deal because what you're looking for is tiny spots of color like this down here. And it's only when you get down among the grass and start looking really close that you find a lot of the treasures. Typically something would attract my attention and I would get down on my knees and, um, uh, and then start finding a whole bunch of additional interesting things like this uh, miniature gentian. Again, I, uh, I have seen it in other places, but only very, very few scattered plants. Um, but this is Ping Mountain. We don't have just one rare little gentian. We have two of them. Um, the species name Glauca means blue-green and refers to this very unusual um, uh, color of these flowers. Another plant that I've not seen anywhere else this little Corydalis, uh, not endangered, but something that you rarely, rarely see. And on Ping Mountain, even the dandelions are special. Uh, because this is a native alpine species that uh, is, is rare to see, not endangered, but only grows at high elevations, and uh, just a real special treat when you do find it. Uh, the the Nodding Campion is right here in the center. Um, small plant, it's, it's widespread, but it's never plentiful and um, quite pretty when you look at it close, closely. But an old Latin name for this was apetala, Silene apetala, which means without petals. Uh, because the petals open and then drop within a matter of hours, so the plant is typically seen this way w without any petals. And even today, the descriptions of, of this species on the web uh, describe it as not ever having petals. But it does. It's just another really special little guy. There is so much diversity among the plants that uh, one day, uh, notably, I parked my car, just kind of stopped at random along the road, and it was five hours before I moved the vehicle again, and I had never been out of sight of the vehicle. That's how much I was, um, I was finding as I, as I um, poked around. Um, another indication of this, uh, my friend Daniel one day told me that he wanted to, to do a long walk along the road just to see what was there. And so uh, I had wanted to go to a different part of the mountaintop anyway, so we decided that I would come back and pick him up in two hours, somewhere along the road. Well, I came back two hours later and found that he had, his long walk had extended uh, not more than about 50 meters. <laughs> and he wasn't happy to see me because he was still finding stuff. Uh, there is a number of miniature uh, willows in, in, in this uh, tundra habitat. This is fully grown and uh, only four centimeters tall. And in fact, on Pink Mountain, we have forests of these miniature will um, uh, willows. Uh, this is the most common of the, the, the BC uh, Jacobs ladders. We have a number of species. And so this one is, is there on Pink Mountain. It wasn't anything particularly unique. But because this is Pink Mountain, we don't just stop with the, with the common one. Uh, this is a northern species. Again, you only see it in the far north. It's called acutiflorum because of the acute um, um, tips on the petals. Acute means pointed. Um, Beautiful flowers, and um, only, as I say, in the far north. 
But this is Ping Mountain, so we're going to be coming back to, to the Jacob's Ladders. Another very special plant is this very delicate um, rock jasmine, uh, Androsache. It's uh, tiny flowers, uh, again, about four or five uh, millimeters across. It just seems too delicate to survive in that, in that environment. And we're going to come back to these as well in a minute. Now, while Daniel was, uh, was with me, it occurred to him, Daniel's a computer guy. And uh, he, as soon as a, a question uh, occurs to him, he goes straight to the computer and, and gets an answer. So it occurred to him to wonder if anyone had in the past made any collections, plant collections on Pink Mountain. And so he was able to access the UBC herbarium and uh, found that, yes, there had been collections made going all the way back to 1960. But no um, botanist had spent more than a day. In, in many cases, it was just a couple of hours on Pink Mountain. So although there were collections, there were, there were not very many of them. But then Daniel carried it a step further in that he compared that list uh, of known collections to the red and blue listed plants for the province and found a correlation. And that was really significant. And that started me looking at this, uh, at this question of listed species. So you, you, probably you're familiar with that. Red listed species are in immediate danger of going extinct in BC and blue listed species are severely endangered and just one step down from, from uh, being red listed. So with input from Daniel and from other uh, professional botanists in the, in the province, uh, at this point we know that there is one red listed species, uh, this is the alpine foxtail, uh, uh, a grass, uh, that's been collected on Pink Mountain and no less than 10 blue listed species. And this is really incredible. They set up preserves to protect one blue listed species. Um, now, the first four of these are, are groups of plants that I'm not that familiar with, so I can only tell you very little about them. The, uh, the first, uh, Lugula, Rufescence is the rusty wood rush. There's only been three collections of this plant in, in all of BC. Lugula confusa, the northern wood rush. Uh, Pink Mountain is a considerable range extension for it. Festuca minutiflora, the little fescue. Uh, there is, this is another grass that was not previously known from, from Pink Mountain. And the, the carex is. Um, a sedge that, again, was not previously known from that area. The, uh, the rest of the plants are flowering plants, and I can, uh, I can show you pictures of those. This is the third species of pulmonium, the third of the Jacob's ladders that, um, uh, that occur up there. It's blue listed. It exists in only a few scattered uh, small populations on, um, on Pink Mountain. And un unfortunately, most of those are right beside the road. So the road on Pink Mountain has become critical habitat for a number of these plants. The Arctic Campion, uh, blue listed. Uh, the, the flora shows that it's uh, been found in only four locations uh, in BC, and two of those are from Pink Mountain. And even on Pink Mountain, these plants are widely scattered, and you never see very, very many of them at all. The, the local weed, uh, plentiful on, on Pink Mountain, but nevertheless, it is blue listed. And a little buttercup that is also blue listed, that is also growing right beside the road. The elegant stitchwort, um, 
another uh, miniature blue-listed plant. Just to give you an idea of the size of some of these things, I stuck my finger in this shot. And a second species of Androsaki, blue-listed, three centimeters tall. The, uh, the flora shows that it's only known from two locations in BC, and uh, it had not been previously known from Pink Mountain at all. So there is just no doubt that just looking at the flowers, the, that Pink Mountain is an incredibly unique uh, place. The uh, Conservation Data Center tells me that there is not another site north of Vancouver that's known to have this many listed species. There are, are other sites that have as many and more, but they are crowded right along the, the border um, and the, in the extreme south of, of BC. So when I was first there in 1983, I would looked across to the west and there were uh, numerous other uh, mountains that seemed to be a similar elevation to Pink Mountain. And I was looking at them and wondering if they had the same diversity of plants. Well, in 2003, I had an opportunity to fly to three of the adjoining uh, peaks. Uh, that's Pink Mountain in the background. On all three of these other peaks, I found pretty much what you see in the foreground here, just solid, thick turf and virtually no flowering plants, virtually none. And so this, this is just a further indication of how unusual Pink Mountain is, but why? I, I, and this, is, this has puzzled me ever since. Until I gave this talk for the first time in Victoria. And afterwards, a geologist came up to me and he told me why. It turns out that this whole country, all of the mountains to the west, and including the north end of, of uh, Pink Mountain, are covered with sandstone and shale. But the south end of Pink Mountain, where all of these special plants are, has been, the, the, the sandstone has been eroded away and exposed limestone. And limestone creates a soil that is much higher in nutrients, the nutrients that plants need, than sandstone soil is. And so this appears to be the reason why that small area on the south end of the Pink Mountain Summit is so different from anything else in northern BC. So that was a pretty exciting breakthrough. You can even see, looking at the north end of, of Pink Mountain, you can see that it's higher because it's still got that over, uh, overlay of, of sandstone. Now, from here, the story goes downhill badly. It goes from bad to worse to, to downright heart, heartbreaking. And um, I'm going to start with the most benign of the, of the uh, threats to Pink Mountain, and that is the casual visitors. When I was there in 1983, I saw one other vehicle in a week. This year, I was seeing one to three vehicles every day. Now, it doesn't, that doesn't sound like very much, but as you'll see, it doesn't take very much to do a lot of damage. Most of these casual visitors appear to have no idea why they were there. I, I, I would watch them, they would drive up to the highest point and turn around and drive back down again. Um, th this group was a little different in that I was, they at least got out of their vehicle. <laughs> But um, I, I was sitting um, making notes in, in my vehicle and I heard this roar and this thing tore around me, drove through the plants to get around me, went up to the absolute, the highest point it, it could get to. If he went for five feet further, he would have been going down that steep west side. And five people leapt out and scattered in all directions. And no kidding, I watched them. Within two minutes, they'd all come back to the vehicle. Well. What do we do now? Well, what, what they did was, well, maybe if we stand on the picnic table, that sounds like fun. 
I guess the view was, uh, was better from up there. And we'll just throw our empties down the slope. Every day that I would carry a, a bag of garbage off of the mountain. Mostly it was beer cans, but there was a variety of junk. These are shotgun shells, so there is still shooting going on up there. And uh, these tracks that could easily be decades old uh, goes, just goes to show that what one Yahoo in a 4x4 four four can, uh, can do. Now there is various contraptions scattered around the summit. The, the antennas in the background are operated by TELUS and I'll, I'll talk about them in a minute. This thing in the foreground, I have no idea what that might have been. I never saw anybody go anywhere near it. And then there was this other shed which apparently had um, sheltered a, a, an instrument at one time, but the instrument is long gone and uh, the shed has just been abandoned there. This is, this is uh, crown land, so anybody can go up there and do anything. There's no control. As I walked up to this thing, I could hear a loud chewing noise. And so I kind of tiptoed the last little bit and stuck my head in the doorway. And here's a, a pack rat <laughs> who is literally eating the plywood. And um, apparently he and his friends have been at this for quite a while. <laughs> so. We have this, this um, some irresponsible commercial operation has, has uh, left this, this shack up there, but not to worry, we have a one rat demolition crew at work. <laughs> now there are, there are two high points and both of them have antennas. Um, and unfortunately, these antennas require power and so they have generators and um, a couple of them are powered by diesel engines which create noise pollution which you can hear depending on where the wind, which direction the wind is blowing, you can hear them uh, from anywhere on the summit. The TELUS has, uh, has four or five antennas up there. As you can see, one of them is powered by, uh, by solar panels. Another has a diesel generator and another is powered by propane. And I was absolutely astounded to see these huge delivery trucks up on top of this mountain negotiating that road to bring fuel to these antennas. Now the tragedy of this is that these heavy vehicles are just destroying the road. And so at some point that road is going to have to be built or rebuilt and that's going to mean the end of a large number of the special plants. When I was there first in 83, uh, there were two uh, gas wells that had uh, the Christmas tree arrangement on the, on the top, but they were rusted and obviously abandoned. But I have worried about them ever since uh, because at any time they could be reactivated and that was the case this year. I found that the on the first one, the, the valve assembly had at least been painted, if not completely replaced. But uh, obviously there was new interest in that well. And the second one now had, um, no, that's still the first one. The second one had an entire extraction plant now built on it. It wasn't operating yet as far as I could tell, but they had made an enormous bulldozed uh, clearing around it that apparently is mandated by law for some strange safety concern. They bulldozed probably three or four hectares of, of this, this delicate alpine habitat. And um, you can see that there's, uh, uh, there's the well and it's connected to the plant and, a, and they've got a flare attached. Um, this is completely a, a complete aside, but they use these flares to control the pressure within the, the well. Uh, apparently the pressure fluctuates quite a bit and uh, can damage equipment. So when they get an overpressure situation, the, the flare automatically lights and burns off the excess, uh, the excess gas. Um, 
worldwide, it turns out, they, they flare, they waste $30 billion worth of natural gas every year. Pretty amazing. And we've got these, uh, these survey posts uh, scattered around, which probably mean there's going to be further uh, uh, drilling up there, which is pretty scary. It's interesting that there's actually a provincial park on Pink Mountain. Now, this was um, variously the, uh, described to me as being established to protect the rare butterflies or fossils. Now, the fossils make some sense, but because the gas industry was in possession of the summit of, uh, of the mountain, Provincial Park couldn't touch that, so they have located the park on that steep west side uh, where it's totally inaccessible. The soil is, is under constant movement because it's so steep, so no plants can grow there. Uh, the park is doing nothing to protect the plants, and it's certainly not doing anything to protect the butterflies because the butterflies have to be where the plants are. So this, uh, this provincial park is just a major uh, uh, head scratcher. Oops, what's that doing in there? Um, when I arrived there this year, I found this collapsed tower was laying in a heap on the ground. Well, it turns out that this was a test tower put up by a wind prospector. And the wind had blown it down. <laughs> I thought that was pretty, pretty uh, ironic. Uh, that tower, it turned out, had been put up three years before. And you can see the, the tracks still just as visible as they were when uh, the, the day they were made. And while I was there, a crew showed up to replace this test tower. And they were there for a week, and I talked to them just about every day. Uh, and really nice people. I, I, I quite liked them as individuals. But they obviously had, oh yeah, and they had, they had dragged up these two trailers, parked them in what to them was just an area of gravel, which in fact was, was covered with plants. And... Um, including those rare dandelions and, uh, and also including the blue-listed buttercup. Uh, these guys obviously had no idea of the delicate nature of the habitat that they were working in because they proceeded to drive their vehicles around. Uh, a couple of days later, they even brought up a backhoe on uh, heavy-duty 4x4, and they drove that around among the plants. Uh, there goes the, the yellow-listed buttercups, or the blue-listed buttercups, and, um, and, and other things already. Uh, squash dandelions. And uh, they, they just tore the place up. No idea what they were doing the damage they were doing. Uh, they used the backhoe to dig down to plant the anchors for, um, for the tower. And I asked them how deep they had, uh, they had been able to dig. And they said five feet. So that was pretty impressive. Five feet of soil on, on a mountaintop is a lot. But then I started thinking, well, how long has that soil taken to accumulate? Probably, well, it has to have accumulated since the last glaciation, maybe 9,000 years ago. And I'm not very good at math, but even a rough uh, division shows that that soil has been accumulating at the rate of less than a millimeter a year. So that's the rate of change in this environment. So the damage that these guys have done just putting up this test tower is going to be visible for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was an interesting um, to watch the operation of erecting this thing. It was pretty painstaking. It took them all day. And in the end, we're left with yet another eyesore on the top of Pink Mountain. But it gets worse. 
Oh, well, we're not quite finished here yet. Remember those first tracks from three years ago? Well, this is what they left this time. The tracks alone will be there for decades and hundreds of years. And the, 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 the torn up plants will take even longer to, uh, to recover. It's just a real shame that uh, I'm sure there are, but there are better ways that, for, that they could have accomplished what they needed to without doing as much damage if they had bothered. But we're about to lose the entire mountaintop now to this. I found out almost accidentally that there are plans in place to put 40 wind turbines on the summit of Pink Mountain. And I, didn't, I realized that I didn't know much about wind power. And this uh, got me thinking and reading and uh, looking for information on the web. And uh, it actually gets pretty scary. It turns out that um, wind turbines are not nearly as eco-friendly as the government and the industry would have us believe. Uh, it's all about making money for both the industry and government. The smallest of the commercial turbines that they're using these days is one and a half megawatts. They, that, th these, as I say, are, are the smaller ones and they're um, uh, 300 feet plus tall. And they're, they're building up to 10 megawatt turbines in the future. These things are going to be enormous. The cost for each of them is between three and six million dollars. And uh, with heavy maintenance, each one of them will last from 20 to 30 years. But what, what I didn't realize and where it gets scary is when you look at the base, each one of these smaller towers requires a, a concrete base that is 50 to 65 feet in diameter and from 4 to 10 feet thick. Now, 25% of that concrete is cement. Now, I bet you don't know how they make cement. They make cement by heating limestone. So they are burning fossil fuel to heat the limestone and the conversion that makes it cement is that the heating drives off the CO2 that's sequestered in the limestone. So for every ton of cement that's manufactured, a ton of CO2 is released into the atmosphere. And then, in addition to that, you've got the steelwork and the blades are fiberglass. Uh, fiberglass is completely unreusable, unrecyclable. The, uh, those blades are eventually going to be, become just landfill. In addition, each one of these bases uh, will take between 40,000 and 100,000 pounds of steel, reinforcing steel. That's another at least five and a half tons of, of CO2 uh, per base. And they're going to put up thousands of these. The blades are 65 to 135 uh, feet long. And um, in 2001, then this is just when, when the wind industry was just getting started. In the US, the wind industry used nearly 50 million kilograms of fiberglass landfill. Those blades seem to be turning fairly lazily. Should be easy to avoid. It turns out that even in a moderate wind, the tips of those blades are traveling at 200 miles an hour. It's no wonder a bird can't avoid that. Um, 
In the U.S., there was an estimate in 2007 of between 20,000 and 30,000 birds being killed. But the, the statement from the wind industry was, well, that's, that's 20,000, 30,000 birds out of a billion birds in, uh, in the United States. That's nothing. But when you put up something like this across a migration route, you're selectively wiping out large numbers of one species. So that becomes um, really serious. Uh, another, um, another spokesman for the wind industry said, well, the birds will eventually um, uh, evolve to avoid wind turbines. This is an engineer talking about biology. It ain't going to happen. Um, the BC Ministry of the Environment has a long list on their website of requirements that, that, that when the wind industry has to meet. Sounds really impressive until you start reading them in detail. And when you do that, you find that those requirements mean absolutely nothing. Nothing. One of the requirements is that a wind company is required to do a, a, a raptor study, a, a, at least a study of a, a raptor use of a potential um, wind de develop, uh, development area. Well, that's okay, but there's not a lot of raptors around. Another requirement is that they have to look at the, the use of migratory birds of that area. But that study isn't required until after the wind farm's in operation. And that's typical of the way the government is protecting our environment. Plus, the, the wind companies are ordered to do these studies, so the wind companies hire the consultants. The consultants are working for the wind company, so they report to the wind company. And then the wind company edits the report and eventually sends it back to the Department of the Environment. So you can imagine how realistic those reports are. But that's the system we have. It's ridiculous. Wind turbines are also extremely hard on bats. Um, there, were, there was one study showed that 2,200 bats killed by just 63 turbines in six weeks. You would think bats, of all things, would be able to avoid those blades no matter how fast they were moving. But it turns out that because of the high speed of the blade tips, they create a low pressure area that extends out to three or four meters around the tip of the, of the, the blades. And when a bat flies into this low pressure area, the, the abrupt change in pressure ruptures the lungs of the bats. And this is how they're being killed in large numbers. Another uh, little aside is that they have not been able to find a gear oil that will stand up to the pressure that is generated in these wind turbines. So apparently they, uh, they do burn themselves up from time to time. Now probably wind, wind power is, uh, is got a place in the future, but if only that they would, they would locate these wind farms in areas that are not going to be uh, damaging to the environment or to the wildlife in the, uh, around them. But that is not even a little bit of the co consideration that's being given to the location of these things. It's only how cheap can we build them and um, how close are they to the grid? In other words, how, how cheaply can we hook up to the, uh, to the ex existing power grid? So we just need to get them to put these things in the right place. On the summit of Ping Mountain, there's, there's lots of space for wind turbines. The whole north end, which doesn't have any significant plants, is, um, is available um, more than enough. The plants are just all concentrated down here. And so if we could just protect less than a third of this mountaintop, we would be able to protect almost all of the uh, rare and, um, and endangered plants. 
The, the area that I would like to see protected includes the, the uh, provincial park. So one approach might be that if we could just uh, increase the boundaries of the park, that, uh, that might accomplish what we want. Um, the catch is, though, that the road comes up right through the area that needs to be protected. And if they proceed with a wind farm, they're going to have to rebuild that road in an enormous way. Uh, there is a, there's a similar size wind farm already in operation just south of Fort St. John that required 17,000 truckloads of cement alone, plus all of the other construction traffic. So uh, they're certainly not going to be able to use the road a as it is. I, w I want the preserve to come down to the tree level, which is about where that last switchback is. Um, so what I'm, uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm What's going to be necessary is that here's the existing road. It be closed off at the base and a new road built along the east side that will access the north end where, um, and, and completely avoid the, the endangered plants. Um, I can't imagine it costing much more to build an entirely new road than to rebuild the existing road. but. Right now, this is all just kind of wishful thinking. The Natural History Societies in BC are, are actually working on a resolution to present to the government and to the wind company in the hope that they might take these suggestions into account. But for now, it looks like the pristine outline of Pink Mountain could soon look like this, just a row of wind turbines. Typically, the, these uh, towers are spaced 160 meters apart, and I divided that out, and that will occupy just about the entire length of the Pink Mountain Summit. And uh, along with access roads and those huge concrete bases, there will simply be no uh, space left for, for uh, plants to grow. So although there's uh, growing interest in this, in this problem, uh, either right now the situation is not looking very bright. And um, so all we can do is hope that this resolution will have some effect. Now just so we don't end on a total downer, I stuck in a few more pretty plant pictures of uh, flowers from Pink Mountain that are always lovely to look at. These mountain avens are a, an interesting plant in that they're, um, they're pretty powerful. There's a, 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 a geological kind of phenomenon that happens in the alpine tundra called a frost boil, where the constant freezing and thawing of moisture in the, in the soil um, pushes stones to the surface and the constant churning makes it impossible for anything to grow there. Well, these, um, these plants are, are form mats, and they start growing from the edge of a frost boil and eventually will cover it completely with an insulating mat and will actually end the freezing and thawing of that frost boil. We have uh, three species of heathers in British Columbia, and uh, of course, this is the one that's most rarely seen another tiny arctic saxifrage. And um, there's been speculation about where the name Pink Mountain came from. I've been hearing different stories over the years. One of them was that at, uh, at certain times the mountain is, all, is covered with fireweed. That caused it uh, uh, to look pink. Another story was that it looked pink at sunrise. Well, in the middle of summer, sunrise happens about 3.30 in the morning, so I never saw Pink Mountain at sunrise. But um, it turns out that limestone has a characteristic that at sunrise, it glows pink. So the limestone may also explain 
where the name comes from. So this year I solved potentially two of the biggest questions. So hopefully, this is not the end of the story, hopefully um, a year from now I'll be able to report that uh, we're, we're going to have a preserve or maybe the wind farm has been uh, has been uh, forgotten about altogether. This is not a good place for, for it to uh, happen anyway. So the story goes on.